AAP stat. Here we go into our final inference or our final chapter of review, uh, inference uh, testing hypotheses. So um, <clears throat> this was our significance tests. Um, you can also call those hypothesis tests or see those referred to as hypothesis tests. So be aware of that. It makes sense. We, we state our hypothesis. Um, but ultimately what we're looking for, it's inference. So we're trying to draw a conclusion about a parameter based on our sample. Um, we're, we're trying to draw a conclusion about that parameter, whether it, it ultimately the, the sample data matches what our null hypothesis. We have an assumption we make about a population parameter that becomes our null hypothesis. And so then if the resulting statistic is far enough away from that uh, null hypothesis, then we call that statistically significant. So that so it's far enough away that we don't think it's just chance, right? When we sample, or if we're doing experimental design, we're doing randomization, uh, it could just be a little bit different by chance. But if it's far enough away that we think that that doesn't just happen by chance, that's when we call it statistically significant. So um, we, we find that that probability that ultimately is the p-value uh, to say something statistically significant. We compare it generally to these significance levels that we might be given in a problem, typical ones. Uh, so we have alpha, we typical ones like point, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.1. If that result is that improbable, smaller than that, uh, then we reject that null hypothesis, say it's statistically significant, and accept the alternative hypothesis. So we had this little saying, if the p-value is low, reject the null hypothesis. Um, so yeah, that p-value is, we calculate that, that's uh, what our, our formula um, does for us. It, it calculates, um, you know, gives us that, that standardized test statistic. We calculate that probability. That, that value is the p-value, and that is just how unlikely that result is. Um, so we calculate, and then it's kind of how improbable that is, assuming the null hypothesis is true based on that null hypothesis. Uh, the p-value is that, you know, based on that, um, it's the probability of getting a sample statistic as, uh, by chance alone, as extreme or more extreme as the one we obtained. Um, so they kind of go through some examples. You've got this full four-step process, state, plan, do, conclude. So we state, uh, we've got our null hypothesis. That's our kind of nothing is going on. Um, you know, maybe it's some prior value we have. Or if we're saying doing like a difference, it's that there's no difference between those groups. So that's our null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis a lot of times um, you know, they are different or there, there is some theory we're looking to find evidence for to confirm, um, you know, that there is you know, significant uh, evidence for that. Um, it's depending on your hypothesis, how they're set up. If it's not equal to, you're dealing with a two tail, a two sided test, uh, or a one tail, right sided test or left sided test. So if it's a not equal to, when you calculate the P value, you find, um, wherever if your if your result is above your mean you go above that but then double it uh, if it's below your mean you go below that and double it you're, you're kind of doing the two tails um, adding them together so you kind of essentially double whatever you know normal cdf result you get or tcdf um, the one sided you just go in that particular direction um, so that's the the state step the plan step so you identify the procedure you can you do it by name or by formula um, so you can you know, take your choice with that and then check the, the conditions. And they summarize them up better on the other page. But um, we've got our randomness condition, our independence condition, and then our normality condition to, to changes depending on which one. So this thing goes into, we don't have to do this. We're, they're doing the pooled proportion. We do use the pooled proportion for our standard error. You don't have to use it for checking conditions. Um, that's what they're referring to in, in some of this. And then they just kind of really briefly state the do and conclude because they get to that kind of later on. But the do, you actually calculate the test statistic and p-value and conclude you make your conclusion based on that p-value. Um, so example, and they kind of got a recap here that goes through um, pretty much all the stuff that we just said. But I like these boxes here. This kind of condense it down in, into, um, you know, this is a one proportion uh Z test. So here's our formula. Here's how we actually would do it. We take our sample p hat, which they show here, you, you, the number of successes out of the number of trials. We take our p hat minus our p naught, our null hypothesis, and then we use our standard error formula that uses p naught in it. Um, so we do the square root of p hat p naught times one minus p naught. Um, and then checking conditions, so that gives us our Z, and then you can do normal CDF uh, towards one of the tails or, or one of the tails and then double it to get your P-value. Um, the conditions, we need to have 
simple random sample or just random is good enough. Uh, we use this one that n times p and n times 1 minus p need to be at least 10, and so we use our p naught to check that condition. And then they don't mention this one, and I want you to check this one. Uh, that's the population that needs to be at least 10 times the sample size, so we can treat it as independent. Um, and that is your one proportion z test. Uh, they're kind of pointing out here, when you were doing a confidence interval, you didn't have a p naught, you didn't have an assumed p-value, so we just used p-hat instead. Here we should use p-naught. We have that null hypothesis. Uh, that's what we're assuming p is for this problem, so we work the problem you know, with that assumption. Uh, so that's our best estimate for it. Um, and so that's what that gets into. And they got some examples there. Uh, and then we have, go ahead and deal with type 1, type 2 error, and power. Uh, I like this chart down here the best. Um, so kind of know the definition of each. Uh, so if we if the null hypothesis is true, but we reject it, it was true. We shouldn't have rejected. That's okay. But we reject it. That's a type one error. Uh, and the, the probability of that is alpha, whatever your significance level. If it's five percent, if the null hypothesis is true, there is a five percent chance you will get a statistic that is so high or low that would cause you to reject. If the null hypothesis is false. We should have rejected, but we fail to reject. We do not reject. We never accept the null hypothesis. Uh, then that's a type 2 error. And if we did reject, that would be power. Uh, so this is beta and 1 minus. You don't have to actually, that, that's never tested, that uh, beta idea. But um, yeah, that is, that, that, like, that, that chart kind of summarizes those, I think, fairly well. But you can look at the, the specific definitions. Uh, and then the big thing to know uh, is how to, how to affect those things. So we can decrease the chance of a type 1 error by adjusting alpha, namely making it smaller. Uh, that'll make it less likely that we'll get significant results when we shouldn't have. But that comes at a cost. It makes it harder for us to reject and maybe makes it more likely that we would make a type 2 error. So making a type 2 error... Um, is also affected by that. So uh, if we want to, um, uh, the, if we want to make the product of making a type two error smaller, uh, we want to increase the alpha level uh, to make us more likely to reject. Right. So that's where we fail to reject when we should have rejected. Like we didn't find significant evidence when we should have. Uh, so that's our type two error, uh, and then that's going to be tied to the power of, uh, of the test. So if we're making the type 2 error smaller and we're increasing the power of the test, we're making us more likely to uh, accept a true alternative. That's kind of what that, that power is uh, in that case. So always pretty much a better option is increase the sample size. Uh, that, that's going to reduce the variability we expect. And then it also reduces the variability in the actual distribution. So it makes us more likely to get that significant result. Uh, if the standard deviation can be made smaller, that's good. We don't usually have control over that, but that's always good. Uh, if we increase the significance level, if we go from alpha from 5% to 10%, that's going to make us more likely to reject, which is going to give us more power, less type 2 error. Um, that's good, but then that also comes at the cost of the type 1 error maybe being a little more likely. And then if the effect size is different, if we can actually move that mean or that true proportion further away, which again, we almost never have control over that. But the bigger the difference is, the easier it is to detect that difference and, and get those significant results. So that's power and error through there. Um, so then this is the two proportion uh, Z test. Uh, so we've got our formula here. Um, and this P hat is a pooled proportion. So we've got this formula here to pool the proportions. They, they write it a couple, I think they, they screw this one up a little bit. I'll get to that in a second. But if you add the number of successes from your two different proportions, so we've got these two population proportions, we're assuming the same P1 minus P2 equals zero, or you could just say P1 equals P2, right? That's the same thing. And then your alternative is if, whether it's greater than, less than, or not equal to zero. Uh, so you have your two sample proportions, but if you bunch those together, add the numerators, add the denominators, you get the pooled proportion. That's what we use in our standard error um, there. Um, and so then that is, let me grab, sorry, on the formula sheet, if your P1 in, equals P2 is assumed, then yeah, you pool there the, the combined proportion, the way they, they refer to it there. Um, but that is on your formula sheet. Um, conditions for doing this. So we need simple random samples. That little s is very important. Uh, and then um, from independent populations, so not they're not matched pairs or anything, that, that actually leads us to, and I think I maybe glossed over that. I think they wrote, no, no, that's in means. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, still independent samples so that they're not, yeah, not related. Uh, and then we need both populations to be 10 times the sample size. They don't state that, but you should check that condition. And then what they had written here uh, actually doesn't make any sense. It's the pooled proportion, but then they see it needs to be at least 5 or 10. 
Um, so that's a way of calculating a pooled proportion, but a proportion can't be greater than five. That makes no sense. So these are the conditions that should have been written here. N1 times P1, P hat one needs to be at least 10, and, and N1 times one minus P hat one at least 10, and so on. Um, they actually say on the previous page, oh, you should use your pooled proportion here. And that's actually true. You can, but you don't have to. You can just do what our book did, which is do it with each sample proportion for checking those conditions. Um, but there is your two proportions e test. So you might want to, you know, kind of mark those pages um, with those summaries on them, right? It's a good save summary for that. You also have that other summary sheet that I gave you. Uh, hopefully, have that sheet up. I'll, I'll repost that at, um, uh, at some point to to say, hey, this might be a good thing to have handy since it's an open note test. Um, and then we get into means. So they talk about Z versus T. So because of the additional error um, we we get when we're using S in place of sigma, the, the T distribution is a little bit wider. Basically, always use T when doing with means. That's, that's kind of what it amounts to. You're not going to be given sigma. This is very rare that you're going to be given sigma, um, in which case you would use Z. Instead, you're going to be working with S, and so you should use T. Uh, it accounts for that additional error. Um, they talk about kind of checking. This kind of is the, they, they talk about how this, this procedure is robust against some skew. I, I assume it should be normal, but if it's not, it's kind of okay. It's still is pretty accurate. Uh, basically, if the sample size is small, less than 15, then you actually need to check your data. You know, make a box and whisker plot, uh, and, and make sure there's no outliers or skew. Uh, if you have a mid-sized sample. You can check the graph, and there can be some skew, um, uh, but we still really don't want outliers. We don't want strong skew. And then if your sample size is large, our book drew the line at 30, but 40, you're, you're good to go. CLT, normal, we're set. Um, so uh, the general formula, and, and I, I would throw the word in here. This is a standardized test statistic. That, that's our kind of our... our, our um, our, our formula that we have on our formula sheet this is a standardized test statistic. The test statistic, when people say that, a lot of times they actually just mean the statistic. You know, your sample mean or your sample proportion is your test statistic. Once you find out what the Z or T score is for it, uh, then that's your standardized test statistic. So I kind of thought I'd correct that there. Um, so uh, yeah, pretty much you don't do this. Your formula you're going to use for a one sample. Uh, t test uh, for one mean, a single mean, um, and and you've got these bits and pieces on the back here where you can kind of make it. You know, you got your your standard error over there and your mean there, um, and you can kind of build your own formula. But it's it's right here, right? This is this is what we ultimately want. It's your statistic minus the parameter, whatever mu naught is, your null hypothesis divided by sample standard deviation over squared n. That'll give you your t, and then you can do a tcdf where degrees of freedom is sample size minus one. Um, and so then the conditions we want, the simple random sample, or the just random sample is good enough, uh, and then we want either our population's normal, or we want a large sample, or we might check our, you know, that's kind of this stuff here. We check our sample, you know, check a look at our sample, make sure it, we can assume our population is close to normal. And then the one they're not checking anywhere is that population needs to be 10 times the sample size. Uh, and this is where they note that if you're dealing with paired data, if you're doing uh, matched pairs, you actually just do a list of differences and you do mu d equals zero. And so you actually do a one sample t-test with a list of differences. So that's one sample mean. Uh, if you're doing two-tail, um, Oh, so this is this is relating confidence intervals to significance, two-tail significance tests. Like if your 95% confidence interval doesn't contain your null hypothesis, then you would reject at the 5% two-tail level, and uh, you know, vice versa. If your confidence interval does include that as a plausible value, you would fail to reject. So that's kind of what this statement says. Um, if your confidence interval does not contain it, then the significance test based on the same value would reject it at that that corresponding alpha confidence uh, confidence level um, and vice versa if it's contained then it, you would not reject it so then we have two means uh, two uh, two sample t test so your null hypothesis mu1 equals mu2 or mu1 minus mu2 equals zero your alternative is it's greater than less than or not equal to um, and so then they've got you know standard error formula this is like never going to happen that you would know uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2. Instead, you're going to be using this formula. We use the sample standard deviations, and so you end up with a t distribution. The degrees of freedom is kind of tricky for this one. This is where you can either go with the fancy one in the calculator or the smaller of the sample sizes minus 1. I usually go with the one in the calculator because 
you know, then you can do um, two sample t uh, test in the calculator and just use the numbers that it gives you. But get that test statistic, then you can calculate that p-value using the degrees of freedom, uh, and then see if that p-value is small enough to reject your null hypothesis. Uh, conditions, so we want random samples again, uh, and then we want normal populations or large sample sizes, and one and two greater than 30, and then they don't check that 10 times, population 10 times the sample size condition. So make sure you do that. Um, and then watch out for matched pairs. All right, sometimes data looks like it's it's two sample t-test, but each of those data values is paired. You should just do a list of differences and then do a one sample uh, test on the differences. Um, so that's that. Take some extra time. Look through those review. Do some practice. Uh, do some frappies. Let me know what questions you have. Um, and, and that covers it. Um, these last two chapters here... Um, our um, inference for regression that was one of the topics that we did not cover and will not be on the AP test you can learn about it I I, I welcome you to uh, to do that and there's some good videos uh, I posted in our course materials that were run by the college board um, and then um, the last chapter is inference for categorical data categorical data that's chi-square uh, also good stuff but not going to be tested this year so I'm not requiring it um, so uh, feel free to look at that at some point, you know, maybe even this summer if you get bored or something. Uh, you want to make sure that you're ready for, for what's to come. But that's the, the content review. Um, I'll uh, have some more test-specific information for you guys um, starting uh, next week. I uh, just want to get you through the details. I wanted to get you through the review first. Now we can really focus on the details of how am I going to get on the test. Maybe you're already hearing this from your other teachers, but uh, I'll feel obligated to do it as well. Um, and then we'll just do some more practice, and I can try and get you some more questions where I think those are really what the actual AP test is going to look like. I've tried to focus on them specifically, but the truth is that the, the free response questions you'll get will be kind of multifaceted, where they're kind of test multiple things in one question, since you only have two questions. So uh, look to that next next week, but wrap up, finish up strong with this review. I think you guys will be in a great place. Talk to you soon. Hope you guys are doing well. Stay healthy, stay happy.